Welcome, everyone. We're pleased to have Jonathan Ellis with us today. He's going to tell us what Python can learn from Java. Thanks, Ed. I thought this. <laughs> I wanted to put this slide up first to just say that there are good parts to Java, just like there are good parts to JavaScript. Uh, not the same good parts, but they both exist. So my, I, I wanted to put out my, you know, my, my background, where I'm coming from, giving this talk. Um, I'm coming from a, a systems engineer background. Um, I, my first big system that I wrote was uh, the storage engine for the backup provider, Mosey. We're storing petabytes of data across hundreds of machines for you know, people who wanted to back their stuff up. Um, it, it seemed like a great fit for Python since you know, we're mostly uh, waiting on I.O. In, in that situation, uh, not so much CPU bottlenecked, uh, and, and Python you know, gave, gave me a great way to uh, you know, develop quickly. You know, we, we got to market when we needed to uh, and, and were able to develop the features we needed to uh, and, and outdo our competitors at the time. Uh, since then, I've been working on the Apache Cassandra database. Uh, which is a, a distributed system uh, dealing with big data uh, in Java. And the, the difference there is that uh, in Cassandra, we are very much CPU bound a lot of the time. And, and Python was, was unfortunately not a great fit there. Um, so my, my, my background is that you know, Python's kind of my first love, and I've been coming to Python since 2005. Uh, and, and I want to you know, give this talk in the spirit of how can we uh, make Python better, even by learning from you know, one of the four-letter words uh, that, that's out there. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that Java developers first uh, brought uh, to the world was that uh, Java is so verbose that you needed help. Uh, and, and, and but, and the, the good part of that was that you know, first-class development tools really got uh, a kickstart from the Java community and, and really leapt forwards from that. And uh, to their credit, uh, Python has largely uh, learned that lesson. And there are excellent options uh, for powerful Python IDEs. Uh, and I, I, I put this slide in here because uh, there are still some stubborn holdouts using Vim and Emacs. And I say to you, repent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I come again as one of you. I come in peace. <laughs> I've been using Emacs since 1992, and Control X is burned into my brain. But no, in seriousness, though, uh, Wingware is written by a couple diehard Emacs users. Best Emacs key bindings I've ever used in, in anything other than you know Richard Stallman's offspring, uh, and and it, it's really a very good environment, and and you will feel at home there. Uh, similarly, PyCharm uh, from the JetBrains guys, really really first class Vim uh, bindings. So I would definitely take a strong look at those two. You know whichever camp you're coming from. Uh, JetBrains has a booth here in the exhibit hall. Uh, Wingware has a birds of a feather session tomorrow morning. So. I would definitely check those out. Um, so the, the, the corollary, though, is that you know, despite that you know, we want great tools as the Python community, you know, these uh, IDE authors are limited by what they can do by the Python runtime. Uh, and so one of the, one of the first um, kind of breaths of fresh air that I found uh, moving back to Java development for the second time was how easy it is to attach a debugger to a running Java process and, and, and start setting breakpoints from my IDE and seeing what's going on inside it. Uh, so the top, at the top, these are the command line flags that you'd pass to a Java process to tell it, set up a remote debugger, listen for it on port 1044. Um, and below that, I have excerpted a couple of the 11 steps that you need to do to do something similar uh, with Wingware. And I, I say this not to pick on Wingware because they've done the best they can do, but because Python runtime doesn't give you that hook, you, you have to jump through these ho hoops. And Wingware, you know, this, I use them as an example because they had the best documentation. So this is to their credit, not, not a slight on Wingware. Um, 
Another part that's, that's closely tied to the VM is that Java has this thing called JMX, the Java Management and Metrics Interface, uh, and that, that it gives you a standard way for your application to expose information about itself as, as well as a management API that's introspectable uh, to any tool that, that knows how to speak JMX. Uh, so here's three examples of, uh, of different tools uh, all uh, you know, making use of the same JMX information. Uh, on the left, we have uh, the Java Visual VM, which is kind of the next generation J console. Uh, on the top right is uh, Datastax Op Center, uh, which is a Cassandra management and monitoring tool. Uh, and on the bottom right, we have another example of, of Cassandra monitoring, uh, this one from the, the Graphite monitoring tool. So, you know, having that uh, as, as a standard that you don't have to, you know, reinvent any wheels, you don't have to one-off any parsing, uh, you, just, you just start using JMX and tools know how to consume it. There's problems with JMX, primarily that it has this really Baroque FTP-like session handshaking going on, but just that it's out there is, is a huge step forward. Uh, the other thing that, that it gives you is it, it lets you expose methods to control your application at runtime and affect its behavior. Uh, we use this in Cassandra so that you basically never have to restart Cassandra if you want to change one of its configuration settings. Uh, either you update the file and we reload it automatically, or you just tweak a setting in JMX if you want to do it temporarily. And it picks that up without having to do any restarting. Uh, the closest thing to this in Python that I know of is Twisted's manhole, which kind of gives you a, you know, a way to SSH into your application and start you know, using a Python interpreter, which kind of solves the management problem, uh, you know, assuming that you know what, what functions you're looking for, uh, but it doesn't help with the metrics at all, which is a big thing in system software. Uh, so I mentioned that, that I wrote this uh, uh, storage system in Python for, for Mozi. I gave a talk about this uh, a few PyCons ago, and this is one of my slides from, from that PyCon load these many years ago. And, uh, you know, basically it's got a bunch of servers that speak to clients and, and you know, figure out what they want to back up and then start streaming that data off to, uh, you know, the data servers that are loaded with disks and store the information. Um, this is a problem I ran into. So this, this actually... <laughs> This, this had a sad ending, uh, it, which was that you know, the graph in the lower right here was uh, you know, our memory usage of the, the front-end servers uh, over time. Uh, that it just get, it went up and up and up and up because of uh, Python heap fragmentation. Uh, so a little, little background there. Um, you know, when, when, you, when you have a, uh, it, whether it's a garbage collected heap or a manually, you know, malloc and free managed heap, uh, when, you, when you have data allocated and then, then it's not used anymore, it kind of leaves these holes uh, in, in the heap. Uh, so as you, as you can see in this diagram uh, on the right, uh, for instance, if I, have, if I want to allocate 100 bytes uh, and I have uh, you know, 60 bytes free in, in one range and 80 bytes free in another range, you know, I have 140 bytes free, but I can't put that 100 bytes anywhere because I, I need that to be contiguous. And so that, that's what the compact part of, of garbage collection is. It, it needs to be able to shift memory around to fill in the, those holes and give you contiguous ranges uh, to allocate. Uh, so commonly this is used, uh, done with a, a mark sweep uh, garbage collection uh, algorithm, uh, and, the, and the last stage is, is compact. So Python uh, uses a, a reference counting garbage collection for the most part, uh, supplemented with mark sweep, but not compact. Uh, and, and so it's kind of a double whammy because reference counting uh, isn't a great approach to begin with for if, if you're interested in performance. Uh, Modern uh, runtimes are, you know, they basically all use, uh, well, there's different approaches that they use. They, people are kind of searching for the best solution. You've got Mark Sweep, uh, you've got the, the Java 7G1, uh, you've got Azul's uh, C4 collector, uh, uh, the IBM JDK uses something different altogether, so does JRocket. But the thing they have in common is nobody uses reference counting because it performs poorly in this very common scenario of doing allocation and doing assignments. So the summary is that, that the, the garbage collector isn't great and it's made worse, it's exacerbated uh, by having poor instrumentation. 
Let me give, me, uh, give an example of what I mean by that. Um, when I was uh, uh, working on Cassandra a few months ago, I, I introduced a bug uh, where uh, I was allocating memory and not freeing it. I mean, that's, that's what the, the fundamental problem was, and so eventually it would run out of memory and crash. Um, and this is a bad thing, but the good thing is that uh, the JVM gives me the, the tools to analyze a heap dump of what, what state the Java heap was in when it ran out and crashed and see you know, where, uh, where was the memory going. And, and not only did, will it give me like, the, the raw uh, uh, fields and, and, and types of the objects that are consuming the memory, but it, it, it's a little bit hard to tell, but you, you get this tree diagram of you know, what the owners of those objects are, and you, and you can drill uh, into it and, and move up to it. And so I was very quickly able to narrow in on what, what the bug was that I'd introduced to cause this. Uh, besides this kind of static analysis, uh, there's, there's tools available that let you do this basically at, at runtime with little to no performance overhead. Um, Foursquare and Twitter open sourced uh, two of these tools that they use in production uh, within, a, within a few weeks of each other. Um, Twitter in particular, uh, you know, they use this to, when they push a new version of their application, uh, if they're monitoring reports that it's doing more allocations than it did before, they consider that a regression and that needs to be fixed. And that, 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 that's the kind of uh, things you can do with this. Uh, there's commercial options for this as well, AppDynamics for instance, but uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, these open source options either. And the, way, the way they're built is uh, the Java uh, virtual machine gives you uh, this, this interface uh, called the Java Agent API that lets you intercept uh, internal uh, you know, JVM actions, for instance, allocating memory. Uh, another thing that we use it for in Cassandra is asking the JVM, you know, here's this structure I have with you know, references pointing off into different, different parts of the, the system. Uh, how much memory does that actually use? including JVM overhead. Uh, and, and so, you know, this is something that I struggled with in Python was, you know, how much memory am I using to have this, you know, 400 byte uh, piece of data? How much, how much is the virtual machine adding to that? Uh, how much does it add to it when I switch to this different data structure? Uh, so, we, so we have that available uh, in the Java ecosystem to be able to uh, get that kind of self-knowledge at runtime. Uh, the, other, the other building block that a lot of these tools use is called ASM. It's a, a Java bytecode uh, generator and, and introspection library. It's kind of the equivalent of the Python AST module, except that it's performant enough that you can actually use it at runtime. So uh, just, just to throw out that you know, not all hope is lost and, and people are working on this, these, these problems in the Python world, um, there's a project called, I'm not sure if it's Heapy or Heapi, but uh, you know, it, it's you know, starting to take those steps to be able to analyze you know, where does my memory go uh, in a Python system. So it's, it's, the, you know, progress is being made, uh, although Heapi hasn't advanced a whole lot in the couple years that I've been watching it. So, you know, there's an op opportunity there to, to make people's lives better. Um, so switching gears a little bit, uh, moving up a little bit from the JVM level to kind of the, the, the library level. Um, this is a principle that applies to libraries as well as to abstractions and a lot of other things in programming that uh, the more you care about performance, uh, you know, the more you have to care about the details. So this is a, this is a list of the different maps that we use in Cassandra. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's more maps out there that other projects use, but these are the ones we use. Uh, so you've got your basic hash map, kind of like the Python dict. Uh, then you've got a tree map, which, is, which gives you sorted, uh, you know, uh, thread unsafe uh, map interface. Uh, you've got immutable map, immutable sorted map, concurrent skip list map, which is a thread safe sorted map, concurrent linked hash map, which is useful for building caches, snap tree map, which is a, a sorted map that you can do uh, constant time cloning of, uh, non-blocking hash map, which is a, a very, it's a, it's a lock free uh, thread safe uh, hash map. Uh, and then you have like the pseudo map things like by map, which lets you say not, not only what value is associated with my key, but what keys are associated with a given value. Uh, multi map, which lets you associate multiple values uh, with a given key. And that's not just a single class, that's an interface. You have array, ma uh, array multi map and uh, 
hash set multi-map, and, and so, so that you have these options for when you care about performance. It's important. Uh, on the list side, you have a, a similar set of options. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about copy on, array, copy on write array list later, but other, other than that, I just wanted to say you have options when you need something that looks like a list as well. Uh, so the, 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 the question then is that you know, why don't we have something similar? Why don't we have this richness of options in Python? And I think it comes down to that you know, when I'm writing Python code, uh, most of the time I don't want to write C code. But unless I write C code, I won't have you know, the same kind of performance that I get with the built-in options. So most of the time, we just suck it up and we continue to use the built-ins, even though it's not 100% the right tool for the job. Uh, a question I get sometimes is that, you know, so you, you, you come from a Python background, you would much rather like Python, uh, write Python than Java, why are you writing uh, Cassandra in Java? Why not you know, use Python for it and optimize the hot uh, loops in C or something like that? Um, well, there's, there's a couple problems with that. One is that uh, Cassandra is only about 50,000 lines of code, and it's almost all hot loops. Uh, the 10% the that's not, it's not worth kind of forking the development into people who only know uh, both Python and Java uh, to write. It's, it's not worth it. Uh, that kind of polyglot development is attractive when you have a small team uh, and, and not a wide audience for the code base. In fact, we actually do that uh, at Datastax for our Ops Center monitoring tool. We, we use Twisted Python for the back end. We use Clojure uh, to interact with the JVM. Uh, why we don't use Jython uh, for that is another talk that hopefully Tyler or Nick will give some time. Uh, but you know that that can work, but it's not a good it's not a good fit for a project that that you know a relatively high profile open source project that wants to attract a lot of developers. Um, so my hope is that that PyPy will will solve this problem that it will make it possible to write. Uh, you know, kind of uh, first-class libraries in Python with, with competitive performance. A couple years ago, uh, one way to do this would be to, was to write extension methods in R Python, and it, it looks like that's been kind of, uh, you know, don't do that, uh, and you know, I'm not sure exactly the details what's going on there, uh, but I, I'm kind of bummed about that. But, uh, you know, hopefully someday uh, that will be a solved problem. Guy Steele gave a talk in 1988, uh, kind of along these lines, uh, called Growing a Language. Uh, there's video of, uh, of it available. Uh, it's an excellent talk. Uh, but his, his point was that uh, you know, when, when you're creating a language or a language ecosystem, uh, it needs to be able to grow. It needs to be, you need to be able to extend the language in itself. It, it's, it's an important part of, of having a growable language. Uh, and he, he, come, he came from a Lisp, Lisp background. Uh, and then uh, worked on Java at Sun. And so he was talking about, I think, primarily about you know, Lisp macros and that sort of thing, but it definitely applies to building libraries and being able to extend your language in that respect as well. So uh, you know, a lot of these libraries that I was pointing out in the, on the map side and on the list side uh, are dealing with concurrency. So we had uh, you know, concurrent skip list map, map for instance. Uh, if we didn't care about concurrency, we'd just use tree map for, for a sorted map. Uh, and you need the two options because when you add that thread safety into it, you, know, you do compromise on performance a little bit. So if you have a single threaded situation, then you want to be able to just use the, the raw tree map instead. So you really need both. Um, some of the other things that uh, Java gives you in, in help in dealing with concurrency are, are things like uh, the executive, uh, executor service API, um, thread pool executor, uh, fork join pools. Uh, that, that, you know, it's, it's again, it's, a, it's kind of the same philosophy that Python has in the sense that it's a batteries included uh, environment. Uh, and in this case, you know, Java has, has some pretty good batteries uh, that, that, that keep you from needing to reinvent those wheels uh, when, you're, when you're building a, a, a system in, in Java. So one of the problems I have with the concurrency story in Python is that you know, in some quarters there seems to be a little bit of denial uh, where you know, people say, well, you know, just spin up multiple processes. Uh, instead of threads, or you know, just use twisted instead of threads, and you know, both of those have uh, they they have their place, 
but uh, that place is not in the kind of system software that I deal with, uh, where you need, to, you're, you're, you need to have high performance, and that implies that you can't be doing copies across different processes, and you, need, you can't treat uh, local and remote computation the same. You know, one of, one of the things I've heard people say is that, well, if you need to use multiple cores, then you also need to use multiple machines, so you might as well just code everything as if it's, you know, remote, uh, you know, uh, across the network, uh, which, which works, but it's not performant. You, know, you, you really need to treat that local computation differently uh, to get good performance. Um, so, Fragmentation, also uh, an, an, uh, a consequence of, of doing copies. And one of the ways to avoid this is to uh, use an API that lets you, you know, break your data up into pieces without actually copying it. So in Python, uh, there's, a, a, I think, a relatively uh, poorly known library called uh, the memory view uh, class, in, in which deals with buffers under the hood, that lets you do this. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the analog of the Java byte buffer. And no discussion of concurrency would be complete without the global interpreter lock, of course. Um, I, don't, I don't feel the need to beat this horse into the ground too much. Uh, it's mostly dead, I hope. But uh, I, did want, I did want to do a quick poll here. Uh, so who thinks list.append is thread safe? If I have 1,000 threads executing list.append x, is that thread safe in, in C Python? Hold up your hand if you think it is. Are you holding the lock or not? <laughs> That's the question, isn't it? You're, you're running inside Python code. You're not running inside a C extension method. So you can assume that, that you know, the global interpreter lock has got your back. All right, OK. How about x equals x plus 1? How about x plus equals 1? A few more. OK, well, this is the answer. So. I like x plus equals 1 because it looks like it's a single statement and it ought to be protected by the global interpreter lock, but it's not. Uh, and so you know, this was a good quote uh, from a discussion about the global interpreter lock. This is really a, an implementation artifact, and you can't rely on it uh, for any real thread safety. So what, what's our option? Do, do we have to be doing explicit locking all over the place, uh, assuming that we're not you know, you know, doing single-threaded uh, uh, processes with, with the copies that that entails. Uh, one of the options is to use what we call concurrent data structures that, that build the thread safety into the structure rather than external to it. Um, another option is, is to simply avoid mutable state entirely. Uh, so the, you know, the, the simplest example of that is to be using final objects and final fields. Uh, the Python uh, approach to that is to say, well, if you don't want to mutate the field, then don't which is a very kind of zen, kind of pythonic approach to things. <laughs> but the, the, the problem, the final, it, it, has, it helps in two ways. First, it tells the compiler, you know, this is my intent, so double check that I don't violate that accidentally. And it also tells other people who are using your code, it, it, has a, it signals to them as well that this was your intent, even though you know, they might not be part of, of your, your team, they might be part of you know, a wider open source working group. Um, then we also have things like immutable collections, fairly straightforward. And then the next step the, is, is the rocket science part is called persistent collections, which is where uh, you, when you modify a collection, it, it preserves as much state as possible and, and shares it, but it creates a new version of that object that, that contains the change you made. And these, these, these are either constant time or logarithmic time changes. So it's almost like magic. Uh, and the, the, one, the main one we use in Cassandra is called SnapTree Map. Um, very cool library. So finally, in conclusion, um, I, I, I kind of wish uh, Jython had some more love uh, from the Python community because personally, if I were writing a project where I did have those hot loops and I had 90% of my code in cold loops and, and, and I just had to optimize that 10%, I'd much rather do that in Java than in C. Uh, you know, having that garbage collected environment is, is, is just so much more productive. Um, but you know, in, until then, uh, yeah, this is, this is the world we live in, and hopefully, my, my hope is that PyPy will, will kind of take us to the promised land and uh, make us be able to write Python libraries that are, uh, you know, 
speed competitive with the built-ins. Do we have time for a question? Yes. Um. Two questions. All right, we have five minutes for questions. If uh, you want to ask anything, just come on up. Um, I'm wondering what are the big features of Python you're missing in Java? Um, the, the big, the one. I'm, the question was, what do I miss from Python when I'm in writing Java? Uh, the most frequent one is uh, list comprehensions uh, and list uh, iterables. Uh, the second most is generators, I think. Hey, it seems that a lot of the things that you're talking about, you know, some of them are things that are core to the way C Python is and, and that PyPy still is. And some of it is just cultural. You know, we don't think about building those kinds of tools. We don't think about doing that kind of analysis. Is one really, you know, is one really a prerequisite for the other or is it just we haven't looked at doing that enough yet? That's a good question. Uh, I kind of, yeah, I, you know, PyCon's a good example of this. That, you know, the last, I, I, I skipped 2011 uh, I was at PyCon in 2010, and it was about half the size. So, so PyCon, Python is is kind of achieving a kind of world domination, uh, and and the more that that it does that, the more there's going to be people who are going to want to solve these other kinds of problems using their favorite language, Python. And so, so I think there's there's going to be a virtuous cycle. I hope. Of, of people saying, well, I want to solve this problem using Python, so first I'm going to build some of those building blocks that let me solve it better. That's my hope. Um, can you go back to the slide with all of the, um, the hash map alternatives? Yeah. Yes. So it's arguably a, sort of both a strength and a weakness that you have a sort of nosebleed number of data types to choose from, especially when you do GUIs? You know, so, uh, such yes, that you, you, so it, it, mm -hmm. is, it is unfortunate that uh, there is no magic wand that makes a single structure be able to solve all problems, but I don't think it's realistic to hope for one. I'm but that's not my point. My point is if you're a newbie and you pick up a, a GUI toolkit or something and you just want to put a widget up and it takes you two weeks to figure it out, that whatever the language choices that lead to this sort of excess of choice uh, were not good? So, yes. So if you're a newbie that just wants to put a widget up, you have Java Util Hash Map. It's a good, you know, jack of all trades, similar to Python's Dict. My point is that having these options when you need to go beyond that is, is a good thing and a necessary thing for, for high performance applications. Uh, sorry, you have a slide of the Guy Steele quote and about extensibility. What does that mean in relation to Java? My, my takeaway from this, or, or rather the, the relevance to my talk here, is that Java is a language in which you know, all of these libraries are written in Java. And, and so I can extend Java in that respect. So I didn't need to get the JDK authors interested in a non-blocking hash map to have you know, that library as, as a realistic alternative uh, to Java util hash map. As um, someone who works in a, a quite a bit of Java shop, the biggest thing that we see is that what you're saying about JMX. Um, I've been even wondering about, there's a project called PyMX, and I'm wondering what's going on with that, and that would really help me sell my boss to Python more easily. Right now, we're looking towards Jython. I'm, not, I'm unfortunately not familiar with PyMX. Yeah. All right, well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you.